All right. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Elsa. Um, our group, uh, me, Kylie, Tarek, and Logan, we focused on uh, health insurance characteristics and access to healthcare across the nation and Minnesota. Um, so just to introduce sort of like wh where we were going with this, uh, our, our primary question, what we were most interested in was um, identifying patterns and trends of health insurance coverage across the country and again, specifically in Minnesota. I, in order to best understand what goes into someone lacking health insurance or health coverage and therefore like where we should focus um, educational resources or, um, sorry, I just noticed that reflection, um, or to um, understanding where to allocate resources to people that need it. Um, we looked at where people have sufficient access to care, which we understood to mean people who do not delay or avoid seeking healthcare services due to how much it costs or where they live. Um, and of course, uninsured refers to people who simply don't have any type of health coverage. Uh, we primarily looked at 2019 um, as the primary year for IDATA because we figured that the pandemic might skew things a little bit. So we wanted to have a picture of what that happened before then. Uh, and our machine learning model also uh, used data from 2015 up to 2019. So um, I'm not going to read off every question uh, word for word, but our we looked at what we were interested in looking at was um, uninsurance rates based on the nation and the state and also counties in Minnesota. We wanted to compare that to demographics and also to offered coverage types in a given area. Uh, we were curious if we could predict the coverage level for a county where people, how much people had health insurance based on demographics or other factors. And we were also interested in the question of whether someone who does have health coverage feels that their coverage is sufficient. So I'm gonna hand it off to Tarek where he, and he'll talk a little bit about our process. Yeah, so I will be talking about some of the research process today. So one of the main portions of our project was finding and processing the data. And most of the data we use in our analysis comes mainly from the US Census Bureau as well as the CDC. And with the CDC, a lot of that data came from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. And in the CDC's words, that's the nation's premier system of health-related telephone surveys. So there's a lot of data we use from that. Um, so our, our data process follows the standard format, uh, extraction into cleaning and transformation, and finally loading that into a SQL database. So below I've included a diagram that describes our data platform, and we created this using diagrams.net. Um, so basically we have four uh, main data bricks to support this diagram. So we have our first one, which entails the data set cleaning. And for that, we primarily use pandas. And then we had two more data bricks to, um, to work with our simulation for data streaming. We wanted to use one of our census data sets to um, simulate the data stream. And for that, we had the producer data brick and a consumer data brick. And then our fourth data brick, our last one was to populate all of our data into the SQL table schema that we created. And we did that within Azure Data Studio as well. And then some of our clean data went to our machine learning models. And we created those in a couple of Jupyter notebooks with Python. And then we imported those into Power BI using the Python scripting within the Power Query. And then from there, uh, we created a data flow within Power BI to establish a connection to our SQL database. And then from there, we use that as our data source to um, perform local analyses on our machines. And then uh, going to the next slide, I'll get into some of our analysis on the national level. So here we look for first why, uh, some reasons why Americans lack health insurance or coverage. And we find that yes, affordability is the number one barrier here. And there are also several other reasons, including uh, they may not be eligible, they don't want coverage, they can't find a plan that meets their needs. The process may be too confusing. Uh, the coverage just hasn't started yet. Other reasons, uh, they lost a job or they missed the deadline to uh, sign up. And this data comes from the National Health Interview Survey. And it is important to note um, that survey respondents are not limited to selecting only one reason, but they can select multiple. Um, so with that, there is a, there's a significant amount of people 
that are also not eligible for health insurance. And we find that to be more prevalent uh, among lower income groups. And then um, oppositely, for not wanting coverage, we see that that increases actually um, as we increase by income. So moving on to the next slide, we also measure average percent uninsured by income level and also sex. And for income level, we use uh, federal poverty line because that way we can account for how many people are in that household. And our main takeaway from this graph was that if you look at the 138% of the federal poverty line or below, the, the, percent, the average percent uninsured for males and females are roughly the same. And interestingly, that increases as we go up to 400% of the federal poverty line or below. So as we include uh, those, of, those who have higher earnings. So that disparity actually gradually increases, as you can see. And that was our main takeaway from this, this visual. So I will pass it on to Logan to zoom in on our Minnesota analysis. Thank you, Tarek. For our first Minnesota visual, we have insurance types by enrollment number and select Minnesota counties. These select counties consist of Minnesota's most populous communities and are listed here in the lower right-hand side of the visual. Within these counties, we found employer-based insurance enrollment to be greater than the enrollment in the five other categories combined. Notice these red arrows, which point out the half million mark on both charts and help emphasize the large number of employee-based health insurance enrollees. For a second Minnesota visual, uh, although no data was available for respondents at the 15,000 to 25,000 income level, we can see on the right that respondents making 50,000 or more a year have the lowest incidence of care avoidance due to cost. For the third Minnesota visual, we're looking at average uninsurance rates by county. We have the highest uh, being 7.85% in Nobles County, this green bubble in the lower left. Lower uninsurance rates are represented by the small pink bubbles which correspond to an uninsurance rate of about 2%. We can see many of these small bubbles in the counties that flank the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, pointed out by this blue arrow. Now we'll proceed to look at our machine learning models. Thank you, Logan. So for our machine learning model, we were interested to see the uh, relationship between age, race, gender, place of birth, educational attainment, and annual salary on the insurance category. So insured or uninsured in each county at the national level. So we first used ANOVA tests to see the statistical significance of different demographics and uh, by population on the insurance category. And so each p-value for these columns was well below our level of statistical significance of 0.05. So after the ANOVA tests, we started with a logistical regression model where we used a grid search to find the best hyperparameters for our model. For this one, we looked at which portion of the population, insured or uninsured, is predicted for each county nationally. The R squared score for this model was 0.84. And so as we were developing, we noticed that each county had the two categories. So we put that into our Power BI model to see if we could predict accurately the different subcategories within each county. So taking that into account, we decided to delve deeper and create a second machine learning model that predicted the population of people who earned less than $25,000 for an annual salary in each county. For this second model, we used an elastic net linear regression to see the predicted populations. And we did not perform a grid search for this one as the elastic net CV automatically tunes the hyperparameters. So we first scaled the data for both the testing and training data sets, then used that data to train on our model, which had an R squared score of 0.98. From here, we can see that there is some clustering around that predicted line. And as we grow higher, we do see more variability as well. And so the purpose for both of these models is just to help provide some insight as to what factors may determine whether someone is insured or uninsured and hopefully provide resources to help them either apply or provide information on the insurance that they already have. And so lastly, we're just gonna go over some recommendations for future data collection and research. We would like to see an increase in the data collection in lower populated areas across the county as they only have the metro areas for the data sources that we looked at. We also would like to see the reasons for lacking health insurance by demographics other than income level, seeing the classification of public insurance enrollees who work full-time by whether or not their employers offered employer-based insurance, 
and to track tobacco use in relation to insurance affordability. Finally, our second model we would like to change to accommodate the several different factors that may determine if someone is insured or uninsured, like age, race, gender, educational attainment, place of birth, and the additional annual salaries that were listed. We would also spend more time tweaking the machine learning models to make sure that the model isn't overfitted and making sure that the model fits the data very well. These next couple slides have our sources. And finally, we've got our GitHub in the QR code if you would like to take a look at our further research and further visualizations. And we are now open to questions. Thank you. Well done. I'm Angela Brecky, the president of Dev10. Tara needed to step out for a minute, so I'm gonna hop in and, and facilitate the Q&A session for you guys. Really nice job. Go back to that first chart, if you would, the one that showed the various reasons, including the cost of insurance. There we go. So I wanna make sure I'm understanding, I'm interpreting this chart correctly. When I look at the reasons for it being too expensive, it looks to me as if it stays relatively the same across income lines. So someone who's making less than 35,000 is saying it's too expensive as, as is someone who's making over 100,000. Do I have that right? Yeah, so the, again, this is, um, so mul people could choose multiple reasons um, on the survey. Um, I included it all just so we could see like a comparison of the volume of the responses. Um, but yeah, so the, 40% um, of the responses included uh, for about each income category incorporated that it was too expensive. I think something important to keep in mind is that 100,000 or greater includes like a lot of different, like a, a very significant range, um, which can go further or less far depending on where someone lives and what their expenses are. So I think that's something that's important to keep in mind. Um, uh, when thinking about the too expensive reason, but yes, mm -hmm. that's that's correct. It does it doesn't change a whole lot. Yeah. Um, I found that surprising. Did you all find that surprising or not? A little bit, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it was definitely surprising. Um, we in we your definitely did not. Slide. Sorry, go oh. ahead. Okay, <laughs> we definitely didn't expect that people who earned the higher income to have such a high amount of them say that it was too expensive or even that they were not eligible for it as well. So yeah, it was definitely surprising for the outcome of, of the reason that Americans lacked coverage. So maybe another way to drill down to this is what Elsa is saying is you need to look at it in terms of those specific counties. Um, so when you take those higher income brackets, is it because they're in those metro areas where the cost of living is higher than in the rural ones? That would be one way to confirm if cost of living is the significant contributor to that being static across income levels. Yeah, we really want, I really wanted, we really wanted to look at that, but um, unfortunately this data set, I uh, did not, they didn't want to give us, um, I didn't find a way to access the location data for this survey, which obviously is collected, but uh, wasn't available for public use due to potential for um, identifying factors. They don't want to identify any of the survey respondents. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't get um, any location data further than um, Midwest, West, Northeast, South. So that is definitely something that I was very, that I was, were very interested in, in general, and also um, in terms of finding out what the other factors might be. You also mentioned in your last slide that there's lack of data in the rural or, or mm -hmm. lower populated counties. Why is that? So we found on the census that most of the data collected came from those metro areas. Um, so we're not really sure why the census didn't include those lower populated counties, especially for the Minnesota data. It only had about 50% of the counties that we have in Minnesota here. So it only had about 30, which is why we opted to include the national level as well. Um, I'm not sure why they opted to do that. Um, but if anybody else wants to chime in as well, they, they definitely can. I think we can maybe brain, I think um, we could come up with ideas per, perhaps because um, there just isn't as much information. Maybe they don't survey as many people from the rural counties. Maybe 
there's not enough information about when the census is going on. I know I missed the memo on the census data collection when that happened um, a couple of, like a couple of years ago, I think. That's a good point. Also, it could be participation rates. That would be the next thing to look at um, to see if that explains the lack of data in those areas. What were some other deficiencies in the data, things you would like to see and didn't have access to? Um, oh, I would just like to say one thing we would have liked to see is for the county level data for Minnesota, more demographic breakdowns um, of the different insurance types. The only demographic breakdown available in some of the county data for Minnesota was by age range. So I think it would be very informative to see other demographic breakdowns as well to help a future researchers, policymakers, advocates really focus in on which communities might need more help accessing insurance and care. I know um, another thing that uh, was definitely, we didn't, we definitely didn't have enough information on or as much information as we would have liked is from the data set where the, the slide that's currently up from the data set that we got that information from there was a lot of information in that data set, but not the demographic information that we wanted to see. So there was um, there was very little data on uh, racial and, and ethnicity um, demographics. Uh, basically the only breakdown by race or ethnicity was Hispanic or not Hispanic um, in this data set. So that was a little bit frustrating to see. Um, and this wasn't an issue with the data sets per the the surveys or like the, the methodology in collecting the data, but a lot of the data sets that we used were surveys. And so the BRFSS data set is, um, the data is already aggregated by category. Um, and so we couldn't see the survey responses. Uh, so we could only see the number of, um, I think the BRFSS data set is the next slide. If you want to, um, maybe not that one. Okay, <laughs> um, maybe not. This is not. But we could see the number, the total number of people in a, in a given demographic, but we couldn't see the number of people in that demographic who also belonged to. For instance, we could see the number of white um, people who responded to a certain question, but we couldn't see the number of white people in a certain income bracket, for instance. Um, so that was a little bit frustrating, but um, the survey obviously does have that data. They just didn't make it available, which I would have liked to have available. Mm -hmm. Any questions from other folks for this team about their project? And while you're typing that in, I'll ask one more, which is you mentioned looking at tobacco usage as it relates to uninsurance rates. Do you have a specific hypothesis behind that? Uh, so I think one of our hypotheses is that um, similar to the breakdown of salary is that for people who did find it too expensive that maybe they were allocating their personal funds towards something other than health insurance. So it would kind of be interesting to see how the breakdown of tobacco use and insurance rates changes. Um, I know that personally, one of my hypotheses is that as tobacco rates rise, insurance rates also rise. Um, but I'm not sure if, if any of my other team members have other hypotheses about that as well. Yeah, I yeah, just so, add, oh, go, go ahead, ahead, please. Oh, you sure? Sorry. Um, Logan, okay. you go first. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to add briefly to, sorry for interrupting you, Tarek. I just want to add briefly. Um, a hypothesis that comes from personal experiences. Uh, previous employers I've had, they do charge an extra monthly fee for self-identifying as a tobacco smoker to health insurance. So I would hypothesize that there are other employers that do that, which would further increase the cost burden of employer-based insurance. Thanks, Logan. Tarek? I'm glad Logan said that because I'm going to kind of build off what he said. Um, yeah, so kind of the main reason we wanted to um, look at that, or we put that in our in our slide for recommendations, um, is that um, 
health insurance providers can charge about up to 50% more um, for those premiums uh, if you smoke. Um, so we wanted to see kind of how that affects affordability, um, especially across the lower income groups that may have a tighter budget. So I think if we could have compared that to um, without the tobacco usage, we could have seen some interesting differences there. Very good. All right, last question for the team. Is this something that prior to the Dev10 training, do you think this is something you would have been able to tackle? Uh, I, I can speak about that. Um, to be honest, really, no. Um, we didn't, we worked with a lot of technologies um, throughout the last three months that actually a lot of us weren't even very familiar with before those three months, um, such as, you know, Azure Data Studio, SQL, Python. I know um, a couple of our group members did have some previous Python experience. Um, but apart from that, working with producers and consumers um, and just database management in general was um, more unfamiliar um, until the last three months, so. Yeah, I mean, for myself, I don't have any sort of a STEM background whatsoever. I studied linguistics. Um, so I didn't have, ex I really had very little experience with any of this um, prior to uh, the summer. So absolutely not. <laughs> Kylie, Logan, any comments? I do come from a STEM background. So I actually have a bachelor's degree in statistics. I did a project similar to this, looking at um, SAHI data for um, the relationship between a sedentary lifestyle and how active they are. So that was very interesting to see, um, but definitely would not be able to take it to this scale. I did not know that much about SQL or Power BI or Kafka, Databricks, all of that. So d I definitely would not have been able to take it to this scale before starting the training three months ago. And Logan? I would say, um, personally, coming from background working in health, I would have definitely always wanted to delve into a project like this, but going through the Dev 10 training really equipped me with the technical skills to see the idea out and really mm -hmm. implement it in a cool way. So it's really <laughs> helped turn an interest area into something. I can, you know, produce a finished product with. So I'm grateful for that. Very good. Well, I'm, congratulations. I'm to hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. So first of all, Logan, Tariq, Elsa, and Kylie, wonderful uh, topic and great presentation. So kudos to all of you and congratulations on your, uh, you know, you are approaching your graduation. So congratulations on that. I have one or two questions with respect to the data source, right? So if you can go back to the survey results that you were depicting on the bar chart, horizontal bar chart. Um, so the question is, have you used this particular data set or data source in your uh, test uh, while training your data model? We did not use this data for our machine learning model. Um, for training or testing. The data that we ended up using was population data, which was broken down, the counties were broken down into insured and uninsured populations by demographics. So the age, race, sex, educational attainment, um, annual salary, and um, place of birth. So we unfortunately did not use this for our, our model. Okay. But if I understand it correctly, the intent of looking at this particular one was you your data analyst hat was on like you wanted to see what are the obstacles people generally face right and then you you wanted to use that knowledge in training your model am i interpreting it right right yes yeah so this this right. visual did uh fuel that second model to look at the population breakdown and predicting the uninsured population for people who earned less than a $25,000 salary um, so we were interested to see how the uninsured portion was um, across the nation within the county for our machine learning model. Okay. And if you can go back to one another slide, I think, uh, which was right before this conversation. Can you go? Yeah. Let's keep going, please. Uh, I want to look at one of the vertical bar charts now, actually. I forgot the title of the slide. Um, 
let, let's stay on that one. Yeah, yeah, this is the one. So on the horizontals, um, I mean, Y axis, number of responses, is it really 14 responses or really is it 14,000, 14 million? What is the number unit out there? Uh, this one is just for um, Minnesota, which we unfortunately did not have a lot of data for. The national chart for this did look very similar in terms of the the distribution, but this this is uh, yeah, so that is fourteen. Just fourteen. Okay. Yeah. Sounds perfect. Yeah. Unfortunately, right, Minnesota once... didn't have a lot of data. No, no, I understand. And, you know, one can ask for huge data, but we know what the challenges are in collecting data and uh, making sure whether that data is trustworthy. Anyway, so thanks for taking my questions and congratulations once again on your, as you are taking a step towards your graduation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Well done, team. And with that, we will move over to team four.